And once again, welcome back to Dallas as the Cotton Bowl countdown continues. You know, we learned a lot about the ultimate, uh, you could say, Cotton Bowl chess match that's going on right now between, yes, the Michigan State Spartans offense and that torrid Bama defense. And I tell you what, it's going to be a fierce chess match come Thursday as well. Now, the mutual admiration session really came to a close at today's news conference when each head coach was asked a very serious question. It revolved around what winning a national championship would mean to their respective programs. And once again, welcome back to Dallas. You know, the final news conference of this Cotton Bowl was held today as both head coaches addressed members of the media who had a ton of questions about both teams as we count down to kickoff tomorrow evening at AT&T Stadium. Coaches took those questions on with good vigor and a good attitude, and they also uh, reflected back about their relationship that spans back a few decades. That's right, Kevin. It's been an exciting day here at Auburn. I tell you what, both Alabama and Auburn played hard as expected. A big crowd, sellout crowd, record crowd, in fact. And it was a pretty exciting matchup. But as we went on throughout this game, it was a little bit of a surprise the way Auburn's defensive front started playing as they curtailed Derrick Henry. But as the game wore on, well, let's just say things started to fall in place here at Jordan Hill. It was a classic confrontation when Bama and Florida met right here on the turf behind me here in the beautiful Georgia Dome. These two teams know each other pretty well when it comes to SEC championships. Previously, they would met seven times with Florida holding a four to three edge in their series. And you could say that Alabama, well, they were trying to change that storyline just a bit today with a lot riding on the line. It was a little bit of a surprise for some, but for those that have followed this game over the years, and a lot have, it was really no surprise because this was a contest where you throw all the records out the window. You don't pay attention to the hype. You don't listen to the pundits. You don't listen to the talking heads because you know both of these teams are going to come out and play some very spirited football. This 68th consecutive meeting on the gridiron between the Tigers and the Crimson Tide started off with all the pomp and pageantry befitting one of America's top college football rivalries with a thunderous flyover by F-16 fighter jets and a special appearance by former Auburn All-American and Heisman Trophy winning quarterback Cam Newton of the Carolina Panthers. This crowd of nearly 88,000 was revved up and into a frenzy by the opening kickoff. On Bama's first offensive possession of the game, running back Derrick Henry reeled off a 30-yard scamper off right tackle for Alabama's second first down of this 80th annual Iron Bowl. That run led to a 30-yard field goal by tied place kicker Adam Griffith. Tigers trailed by three with 11:28 left in the first quarter. On Auburn's second offensive possession of the game, quarterback Jeremy Johnson connects with Peyton Barber on a 27-yard passing catch that's good for a Tiger first down at the Crimson Tide 25-yard line. Just eight plays later, Auburn's Daniel Carlson boots a 23-yard field goal to tie this game at three. Carlson would kick another field goal late in the first, while Bama's Adam Griffith sent three more footballs through the uprights in the second quarter to give Alabama a 12-6 lead heading into the halftime break. Let's move on now to the second half on Alabama's second offensive possession of the third quarter. Senior quarterback Jay Coker avoids a heavy Tiger rush and a sack and goes deep downfield and connects with wideout our Darius Stewart for a 35-yard touchdown strike. Tied now on top 19-6 after the extra point with 5-14 left in the quarter. On their next possession, the Tigers strike back. Six foot five, Jeremy Johnson spots wide receiver Jason Smith deep downfield, and the sophomore out of Mobile makes an incredible catch on the run. 77 yards later, number four is in the end zone. Auburn is back in the hunt, trailing by just six, 19 to 13. Alabama maintained their composure, though, and after another Adam Griffith field goal in the fourth quarter, Heisman hopeful Derrick Henry put the final nail in Auburn's coffin. With a 25-yard touchdown scamper with less than a minute left, Alabama rolls to a 29-13 victory to lock up yet another SEC West crown for the second year in a row. The UAB Blazers took another major step in solidifying their future yesterday as head coach Bill Clark inked a new five-year contract in Birmingham. That's big news. Clark will now be at the helm of the Blazers football program through the year 2019, believe it or not. Now, no financial terms on this new deal were released. The UAB football team is scheduled to return to action on the turf in 2017. Now, the program was reinstated back in June by the school's president after disbanding the program for alleged 
financial reasons. Auburn Tiger sophomore Peyton Barber will be the man in the spotlight running the pigskin for the 18th ranked Tigers this weekend. He'll be facing a tough LSU D unit on Saturday in Baton Rouge, but the tough as nails runner who scored the game winning touchdown in overtime last Saturday against Jacksonville State appears ready. He received the starting nod yesterday from AU head coach Gus Malzahn. The move could very well jumpstart Auburn's offensive unit as they travel to Death Valley once again to tangle with the 14th ranked LSU squad. I mean, it's going to be fun. That's just so true. Meanwhile, in Tuscaloosa, Bama is focusing on those Ole Miss Rebels. The Bama linebacking core already understands that they'll have their hands full, trying to slow down an Ole Miss offensive unit that put 73 points on the board last Saturday against Fresno State. Now, despite the fact that Ole Miss beat Bama last year in Oxford, some Tide players insist that they've moved past that contest mentally and are just right now concerned about the 2015 SEC, SEC battle set for this weekend at Bryant Denny Stadium. Not at all, it's a new season. Well, it's time for a little sports history lesson this morning, Future Masters style. A 62 is the lowest single round score ever recorded at the Future Masters. Well, that record was almost tied yesterday during first round action featuring the young guns, as I like to call them, and the 15 to 18 year old age group. The young men in the Future Masters spotlight yesterday was Ty Strafizi. Remember that name? Oh, what a day he had. He carded a blazing 63. The 16 year old from Davie, Florida stated, yesterday it's the best score he's ever shot on any course in any tournament ty is recovering from a broken heel by the way the injury occurred five weeks ago and the setback hasn't seemed to slow him down at all he started on the back nine ty birdie the 10th 11th 12th 13th and 17th holes to make the turn at five under he continued his dominance on the front nine to finish at seven under par after heading to the clubhouse strafazi shared that he believes he's cracked the dothan county club code yeah, yeah, created a good game plan and executed. Ah, the tr secret revealed. Strafazi giving it all up. Keeping things simple, I'd say. Here's a look at the leaderboard after day one at the 15 to 18 age group. Austin Fulton and Thomas Hogan are tied for second. Two shots off the pace. There's a three-way tie for fourth place. All those young men, by the way, from the state of Georgia. All three, yeah, hailing from the Peach State. You could say Georgia is on my mind. Two golfers are tied for seventh right now at three under par. There are 12 local standouts teeing off of yesterday. They teed off competing for the coveted blue jacket. Last year's second place winner, Strawn Grad Brooks Rayburn, sits atop the Wiregrass leaderboard. The South Alabama signee shot a one under 69 yesterday. Brooks is tied for 15th place. The seven year future Masters vet played the big nine first and uh, was one over at the turn. Rayburn made a move on the front nine with birdies on six and eight to finish it one under for the day. Golf purists are known to recant that you learn something new every day in this sport. And yesterday, yes, Mr. Rayburn learned something new about this year's course at the DCC. The greens were a... Uh Lots of local veterans playing on their home course. You could say yesterday, Providence Christian's Callum Masters is playing in his fourth Future Masters and says this year he's letting the course take the reins. Masters managed to start the day even after nine holes. Two birdies on the front nine put him at two over on the day. Former Providence Christian teammate Kyle Cornelius also took over two over at, in the first round, I should say. Two bogeys on the back nine ties him for 62nd place at 72. Two strokes behind Masters and Cornelius is the 74 club front and center. Another Providence Christian alum, Bo Scott, is playing in his eighth future Masters. Scott had a shaky start with a triple bogey on the 10th hole, forced uh, Scott to battle back later. Two birds helped Bo finish with a 74 after the first 18. So I didn't get off to a good start, but... Uh... Having fun is what it's all about. Now, the Spigner brothers round out the 74 club. William and younger brother Thomas shot four over on the day yesterday. Thomas struggled on the front nine, making the turn at five over, but he sank a birdie on the four, 11th hole to finish the day at four over. William uh, teed off right after Thomas. He was two over after the front nine, but bogey 12 and 16 resulted in his four over finish. William was surprised by one aspect of his game yesterday. My irons. 
I normally don't hit my irons. Well, we'll be keeping an eye on him, no doubt about it. Now, after the first 18, local golfer Alec Davis finished seven over par yesterday. He's one stroke better than John McAllister. B.J. Morrison finished 11 over par. Cade Mavner finished with an 84, while Chase Smith came in with an 89. Yes, our coverage will continue uh, later today. Be sure to join us live at noon, 5, 5.30 and 6.